Fantastic. Thank you very much. This is Steve Conklin, Vice Chair of the Dr. Cog Board, Denver Regional Council of Governments, calling this work session for Wednesday, December 7th, 2022, to order. Uh, and with that call to order, we'll open it up for any public comment to begin with. If you'd like to make a public comment, please use the raise hand feature during uh, this time period. And Melinda will let me know if someone's there and we'll call on you. And we'll give it just a moment to see if there's anyone for public comment. Uh, Mr. Chair, at this time, I do not see any hands raised. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate that. And also thanks to everyone who has uh, joined us tonight. I appreciate everyone being here. Thank you so much. Uh, with that, uh, in the packet, there's the summary of the November 2nd, 2022 board work session. I'll call your attention to that as attachment A. Uh, no action is required on that, but if there are changes to that, please let us know. And with that, we will move ahead. See, we're powering through the agenda to the potential role for Dr. Cog in regional housing conversations. And I will turn it over to Executive Director Doug Rex. Mr. Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. And, uh, and good afternoon, everybody. I am going to try to share my screen. Work. Someone give me a thumbs up when they can see it. Okay, it's... Yeah, we can see it. Is it in pre presentation mode now? Now it's in presentation mode. There yeah. you okay, go. great. Success. No, thank you also very much. And we really appreciate the opportunity today to, to uh, have a conversation with you all about uh, a potential role for Dr. Cog in, in the housing space. Um, uh, Chair Flynn kind of uh, teed this up at the last board work set, uh, sorry, the board last board meeting that this was coming. And um, we've had some conversations with the board and others in, um, in the past. And I just wanted to, uh, you know, we wanted to have that conversation. So just real quick, here's the outline for tonight's presentation. So I, I do have some foundational slides that I just wanted to share with you all. And then hopefully we can have a good discussion at the end, but wanted to start by having uh, just a quick uh, uh, briefing on um, uh, some of the takeaways from the, from the board retreat back in April. Um, again, talk about some recent conversations that help us helped us get to the point of where we are with this uh, recommended idea for you all today. Um, and uh, again, we had some slides that we were very careful that what we as an agency wanted to do in this housing space was to make sure that we're aligning with our core missions, right, which is transportation, uh, growth and development, and older adults. So we wanted to do that. And then we'll talk a little bit about what we are proposing to you all tonight for conversation. And let's get going. So board retreat takeaways. So those that were on the board at the time will recall that uh, last April, uh, April 2022, uh, we had our board retreat here at the Dr. Cog offices and uh, most, if not, well, I think may, really all of the afternoon of that one day retreat was associated with, with, uh, with housing. Um, we did, um, uh, we wanted to get a conversation going with the board to see if there was a space that or a role that Dr. Cog could play in this housing space. Um, and some of the, you know, one of the, before we went into that, that uh, board retreat, we sent a, a survey out to, out to you all to get a better understanding of what communities were doing related to housing and the crisis that we find ourselves. And the takeaway from this slide is basically that there's, there's a lot going on, right? And there's a variety of all of our member local governments and what they are doing. And it is great, great, tremendous work. And uh, we don't wanna uh, downgrade the work that you're doing. And as a result, I mean, we really wanted to be careful about, we didn't wanna duplicate or, um, you know, the work that you're doing, or uh, we wanted to be able to find uh, a space of our own that makes sense, that adds value to the work that you all are doing. And, and as you'll see a little later on, we have a uh, recommendation for you. Um, so the, that afternoon re event of the retreat, it was really associated with, uh, with two items. There was a, a question storming um, a session in which um, we basically, you know, we wanted to know what questions were important to you to be able to decide what Dr. Cog's role is in this space. And we have included those questions that were, that were listed. Um, uh, and you see uh, Commissioner Lynn Baca there. She's looking over the, the, 
the, the questions that, that were raised. We, we have those in your packet. And full mea culpa, I'll be honest, the, the, the greenhouse gas rule and the work that we, we had to do with that over the last eight months after the board retreat kind of ate up a lot of the, the oxygen at Dr. Cog. So now that we're back to, uh, you know, kind of a, uh, you know, more regular process where we're really looking forward to digging into that a little bit more. And then at the end, we had a really quick exercise on role identification, what you all believe Dr. Cog's biggest strengths were associated with, uh, with housing. And these will not surprise you, it didn't surprise me, um, that the, the areas in which we're strongest is in data resource, as a data resource, um, our regional planning efforts, of course, that we do, and uh, convening, facilitating uh, groups um, to get to hopefully consensus on various issues. So let me just talk real quick about the uh, about some recent conversations that we've had. First and foremost, the executive committee. Um, we've had I've been having conversations about this for for a couple months now, and and with the idea of bringing back to the full board um, a a process or a thought as to what Dr. Cog's appropriate role could be. Um, and we've had some recent conversations. So in particular, some metro area county commissioners. Uh, many of you know this, but probably not all of you. Um, Dr. Cog is providing staff support to, to the MAC currently or, uh, for on a trial period. And um, Metro Area County Commissioners, as well as the Metro uh, Mayor's Caucus, um, have been very active in the area of homelessness. Um, MAC, probably more than Metro Mayors right now. Metro Mayors have, have had a housing committee for, for several years. And I know uh, Mayor Bud Starker is on the line. And he can provide some additional details of uh, some of the work that they're they're currently doing. I do know that um, that that the MAC and Metro Mayors met uh, last week, I believe, um, kind of have a collaborative to form a collaborative to have a conversation about homelessness in particular. And by all accounts, that went really well. And it and it and it led me to think about well, you know what? Whatever we do as an agency, as Dr. Cog. I would like to do that in tandem and in partnership with both MAC and Metro Area County Commissioners, or sorry, with MAC and Metro Mayors. Um, I just think the strength of that relationship and the, the, quite frankly, the concept that we can touch so many more locally elected officials um, is, is something that we should, excuse me, really consider. Um, so, so that, you know, really, so it began to ask the questions, right? I mean, are, is there an opportunity for Dr. Cog to add additional value to this conversation um, and not be repetitive, right? Um, so and we've, uh, as, as, as uh, late as yesterday, we had conversations with uh, um, Denver Metro Chamber about this concept and they, they thought it was a wonderful idea. So, um, so I think we would have support of the business community as we move forward as well. So I mentioned, um, at the beginning that when staff was, was looking uh, at trying to develop what our proposal would be, and we spent quite a bit of time in white, you know, kind of whiteboarding this and figuring out exactly what this should look like. We wanted, there were a couple things that we want to make sure. One, and I've, Lord knows I've been repetitive enough about not being repetitive. Um, we thought that was very important. We did not want, because we, we know in the there are a lot of really good conversations and collaborations occurring about the immediate need, right? About the crisis that we find ourselves in with regards to housing. So we felt that, you know, I think there could potentially be a role there for us to facilitate, to have some kind of regional summit to bring parties together to, to um, look at best practices, those types of things. But I think we, we, we tried to find a, a space that was not currently obvious that is being talked about. And the other, the other thing we wanted to do for sure is to make sure that whatever we do relates back to our core missions. And for example, in our Metro Vision plan, there, are, there is a desired outcome in our plan related to housing, right? And the, and the necessity to diversify our regional, regional housing stock and the support and the uh, supporting objectives as well are, are of course in here. So, you know, we, so we are grounded in our Metro Vision plan um, to, to conduct some of this work. So on older adults, let's talk about older adults real quick. Um, uh, you know, housing is becoming more and more of a challenge uh, for, for older adults in this region. Um, you know, trying to keep up with, uh, with um, 
uh, you know, with uh, elevated uh, costs associated with housing in this region is, is significant. Our demographics are changing significantly. Um, we are becoming an older region and, it, and, and older adults have different needs uh, as far as for housing stock than, than other, other demographics. So that is something that we want to make sure that we're conscious of as we develop out this, uh, out this proposal and ultimately a uh, regional housing strategy. Um, the other thing I want to mention that we do know that, you know, there's almost 80% of, of, uh, of older adults in this region are expected to, to remain within our, within our region and not move elsewhere. So again, they have different needs as, as, as we all get older, right, about what that looks like. Um, so it, in, uh, I always think about the, the, um, the story that Elizabeth Garner, the state demographer, tells. I mean, her mother is living in the same house that Elizabeth grew up in back in the day, right? And she's terribly overhoused, and, and, but she has nowhere else to go. I mean, the cost of housing something to, you know, that you would think be to downsize is actually you're upsizing with regards to the cost associated with. So there are some real problems out there. I'm not suggesting I have the solutions, but there, there's a lot of problems, uh, challenges out there that we need to, need to think about. And last but certainly not least, um, we all know that there is a strong correlation um, uh, between uh, housing, transportation, and land use, right? I mean, it, 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 it's very clear. We did, as many of you know, especially those that have been on the board for a couple of years, a, a scenario planning exercise where we looked at um, some of the, that correlation between land use development and transportation. And, and the big takeaways from from, from that research was that transportation um, investments, when they're paired with land use uh, strategies, are very are more effective, right? So it reduces our uh, greenhouse gas um, uh, emissions, our carbon footprint, as well as it provides services so that people don't have to get in their car to drive. They can they can utilize other modes of transportation, and that's very important, of course, as you know, especially. That we now that we have uh, the greenhouse gas rule that we must comply with, so we're we're conscious of that. For those that are um, that want to take a deeper dive into the scenario planning work that we did, this technical memorandum that's on the the right side of the screen here, there's a link at the bottom. So that whole report is there if you uh, wish to uh, wish to review that. And of course, we're always happy to answer any questions or present that to whomever you might feel is appropriate. And, uh, and last but not least, I've already kind of talked about this, the accessibility of, uh, of multimodal transportation and, uh, and the like. I mean, there's, you know, there's, uh, we have a lot of good opportunities. We have good bones, as we like to say in the planning world, regarding um, the ability to uh, locate higher density development within, um, you know, transportation footprints, right? Uh, high capacity transit, for example. And I think this is something we'll explore even further. So let me just talk a little bit about this and demand and what our history has been as, as a region, right? Um, so back in uh, you know, post-World War II, when we had a tremendous amount of growth in this region, much more than we've seen over the last 10 years. Um, you know, we, you know, the challenge was, was you know, trying to find that housing. We had, a, as I mentioned, a lot of growth. And you know, we, what was the solution? Well, it was to build homes, right? And we built a lot in, in first suburban, communities, right? So those kind of the out, the inner outer ring of the, of the Denver, of the Denver proper were built with uh, a lot of single family homes. And that was, that was, you know, because we were, that was the demographic that we were, that was in, that demanded that type of housing, right? And then as we grown as a region, um, you know, the, the challenges was, but then we had this growing workforce and diversification of our economy that required even additional housing. Um, and those, again, were more, more uh, focused on, on uh, young families and the like. And we built, of course, more single family, lower density housing. It, I'm suggesting all of this, not to, not to say that I'm not trying to make anybody feel guilty or, or uh, feel bad for what our housing stock is because that we met what the demand was at that time. But the question is, is is basically, is this the same trend that we're going to see in the future? And I think I have a few data slides coming up that will show you that that's not necessarily the case. So we have to try to get out in front of that and having those conversations. 
let's just have a real look at it. Here's a couple couple slides that I wanted to draw your attention to. I thought this one was fantastic. So basically, it kind of shows how you know our our demographics are changing, right? Um, early on in, in uh, our growth, there was a lot more. So our, our demographics are changing. So okay, I should probably explain what these two lines are. So the blue line that you see here are fa are households with fam with families with children. The uh, the upper line, the more fuchsia looking line, is without children. And you can see the rate of growth from 1970 to present is starting to, to really really show a pretty wide gap, right? So fam families with children um, have remained, you know, have grew moderately between 1970 and 2020. But as you can see, going out into the future, we're expecting that to really level off. But the growth of households with no children is taking off and is going to continue to, 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 ex to accelerate out to the year 2050. I mean, that it just gives you an idea of the, the demographic shift that we're going to see between now and the year 2050. And we have to prepare our housing stock to, uh, to accommodate that in the future, right? What, what does it mean for our housing stock? I mean, obviously we're gonna to continue to have the majority of which is single, single family housing, uh, um, but there are opportunities all throughout this region to, uh, to, to look at ways in which we can accommodate this growth. And this growth is, is, you know, these are young teachers, right? These are, these are folks that we, you know, that att attaining housing right now is very, very difficult. And, and we want to make sure we're able to accommodate in the future if we're going to continue to prosper as a region. Um, just to drive this home a little bit more with regards to our changing demographics, um, this top, top area here in green um, is, uh, is basically as older adults. And we're expecting to, uh, to nearly double between 2020 and 2050, those that are over uh, 65. So that is a significant change in who we are as a region. Um, and we need to be able to be, be prepared to be able to accommodate the services and housing that that uh, that, that demographic needs. Because they, because, you know, keeping older adults in our region is very, very important. They spend money. Um, they have a lot of disposable income. And, uh, and you know, it's, it's important that we're, they're able to, to uh, maintain um, uh, the, the appropriate share of, uh, of older adults and not lose them to other states. But the other thing I would like to point on here is you can see that um, is, you know, this whole graphic and, and the, you know, the kind of increase in, in demand is not really being driven by, by the younger childless households. I mean, in the purple, you can see that's remaining relatively flat, right? So it's really being driven by those uh, older adults now and into the future, as well as, you know, this, this uh, um, kind of the, the Generation X type folks that will be aging obviously as well. Um, Okay, so this is also an interesting slide, and I just wanted to share some additional information and explain exactly what these individual boxes are. So what this represents, right, it's, uh, it's the difference between um, unrealized um, housing, uh, unrealized demand in housing between 2012 and 20, 2019. The green that you see on the lower block here is uh, um, what they refer to as missing households. And, and basically these numbers are based on the number of households we'd expect as the age distribution of our population changed. So that as that demographic change, we would expect that, um, that, there, that quite frankly, that there would be more households in our region than what there currently are. Um, and the reason for that is, um, so is, is that what, what's happening is that in our region, as well as around the country, because of the cost of housing, there's a lot of, of uh, households that are doubling up, right? That they're living under the same roof. They could be multi-generational, could be, you know, could be, you know, your kid that's moved back in with you because they because of affordability of housing. So that is um, that missing household. Um, the, uh, the next one is insufficient availability. And that happens when, when we're not meeting uh, a certain certain vacancy rate, 
And that kind of gets to that point I was mentioning about the state demographer's mom. I mean, there's just not sufficient housing to, to bring down the cost associated with. And, um, and as a result, you can see that that has increased as well. And last but not least is the uninhabitable housing, which basically represents anything that's been, that's been vacated over for a year or so. And, and that's may, remained pretty much um, the same. All right, so that's kind of just a few data slides to get, get, your, get the juices flowing a little bit. Um, so, so what, we're, what our proposal is to you all today um, is really, I mean, you're gonna say, oh my God, another committee. But, uh, but I think there's a lot of opportunity here. Um, so in, the, in your articles of association, as well as your, the, or your committee guideline policy, it does uh, provide for the opportunity to form an ad hoc committee of the board. And uh, we think there's a lot of opportunity here to really, again, to look at um, just more uh, like macro level housing conversations and look at, um, you know, we know where we're going to be in the future with regards to our demographics. How are we planning to meet the need of, that, of, the, of those demographics in the future? And we think this ad hoc committee would be very useful in, um, you know, identifying, you know, potential out, outcomes and deliverables, work on a scope. I think it's our interest at, from a staff perspective to develop a regional housing strategy um, associated with this. So we would, uh, as part of this, encourage board members to participate on this, as well as, like I had mentioned, we have interest in partnering with MAC and Metro Mayors and uh, inviting representation from those two, two associations to participate in this ad hoc as well as other partners, right? And that could be, you know, Chaffa or uh, the uh, Chambers of Commerce or whatever that might be, or, or, or experts in a, in a specific area. Um, and I think, you know, what we'd like to do is really have that group really kind of flush out the details of what this might look like and then bring something back to the full board for your consideration as far as moving forward and, um, and then and continuing the work, right? Um, so. The last bullet here, uh, I should at least mention uh, because you know we have staff resources that we can we can provide to this endeavor. But if we are to work on you know larger projects such as a regional housing strategy or something like that, we do not have the resources in house for that. That we would have to find some additional funding and and there's opportunities to do that. Look for some uh, uh, some private sector investments. Um, they, I know there are groups that would be very interested in this work as well as federal and state funding as well. So um, I, just wanted, I just wanted to point that out. And last but not least, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I just probably leave this slide up. We do have a few uh, questions that uh, just to get the conversation going today, just to get your thoughts on if this is a direction that the board has interest in pursuing. And um, I'll just turn it back to you and you tell me what you'd like me to do next. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Flynn. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, I th uh, thank you, Doug, for putting this together. Uh, fairly comprehensive, although very high level, which it needs to be at this point. But I'd just like to uh, highlight that uh, we have an opportunity to look at the impact, or the possibility, rather, of uh, with the passage of Prop 123 at the state uh, to have a statewide affordable housing fund there's an opportunity to dovetail our analyses of, of transportation projects with a jurisdiction's uh, uh, potential use of uh, housing funds that, uh, that uh, coordinate or that take advantage of or that supplement uh, our transportation investments, uh, particularly rapid transit and uh, alternative modes. So uh, I'm very excited to uh, see us uh, start down this path. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so you, so everybody can see each other on this. Um, those questions are in your packet, of course. We lose Steve. Oh, maybe we lost them. Well, I'll go ahead. Um, I believe uh, Director Smith was next in line. Yes. Hello. 
Um, this is a particularly passionate subject of mine, so I really appreciate this. Uh, one of the things that we had last week was we had a regional gathering of elected officials in Jefferson County, and we were talking about housing again. And, you know, our bad is launching a housing committee. Uh, the Jefferson County commissioners are doing a housing continuum task force. Community First Foundation has a steering committee. So I think we have, you know, if I was to kind of put this in a big overarching theme, I think we have enough committees. I think what we're missing is that single common denominator that is bringing all the people together. So Arvada has a housing strategy. Jefferson County has a housing strategy. Arvada just hired a housing consultant or will be hiring a housing consultant. Jefferson County is doing that as well. So we're overlapping a little too much. So I think where we could really leverage Dr. Cog here is utilizing some of your resources to hire a project managers of project managers, right? How can we bring all of them together? What's your plan? What's your plan? Let's mesh that all together. Um, and I think a lot of the, the cities and the counties could pocket a couple thousand dollars and pool together to give you a little extra resources like you had mentioned, Doug. I think that is the core, core issue is that no one has enough bandwidth. Everyone's doing their own little things. They're meaningful, but we could do it better together. And I think this is the best vessel to bring all of those, you know, ad hoc committees, all those resources. You know, there's tons of people that are applying for grants, but maybe we should apply for them together. So if I was to give any sort of recommendation, I would say that we use, utilize Dr. Cog in a, in a lens of hiring a project manager at project managers, having that liaison, being that single focal point and merging all those plans together. So that would be my suggestion. Okay, thank you, Director Smith. Um, let, let's, I'll, I'll put that in the parking lot right now and we'll come back to it once we, uh, once we have other the, the other questions or comments answered, thank you. Um, uh, Doug, list Doug, until uh, until Steve gets back here, I don't know what happened. Uh, uh, I'll take over uh, chairing the meeting. Thank you very much. Sure, uh, uh, Director Harrison, go ahead. Thank you very much, and uh, I agree with Director Smith in regard to trying to coordinate efforts with the project manager and with the assumption that all those different um, communities had their own sort of project manager. So I would look at it more as a program management kind of aspect and role um, to that. Um, and here in Erie, we're undergoing that um, affordable housing effort ourselves. Um, we've had some very real conversations with our consultant in regard to what that looks like, the costs involved, the, the threats that are out there, the opportunities that do exist, and to reach what we had originally had as a 12% goal by 2035. But what we are learning as we go through the process, that it's because of the land cost that we all uh, that are extremely high in on the front range, the ability to be able to build affordable homes and have developers and uh, builders be able to do that, even if with that at the very low amount of profit that they could have from that is very problematic. And so it's it's very costly. And so I think. I'm sure that this conversation is happening in Jeffco, mm -hmm. happening in Arvada, happening everywhere else. And so I think somehow what we have to do is, we, yes, we try to bring that together and have those conversations. And I think how we can attack it is probably at a regional level, I think, where Dr. Cog might be able to provide that expertise, at least at a regional level, how to roll something like that out is probably a good way to, to look at it because you're going to have thousands of different ideas coming in. And, uh, and it's not going to be coordinated. And I think with the money that's out there, we're all going to be fighting for each other for grants and et cetera. And I think from an inefficiency standpoint, that's rather challenging to do. And so I just know that for Erie, we're, we're having that conversation and we may look at regionally around us with the different communities having those conversations in our sub-regional forums and et cetera and things like that. So, um, so I totally agree that we need to figure it out because it's... Um, it's going to be a monumental undertaking with where we are right now. Thank you, Director Harrison. I apologize. My computer froze up, but I'm back. Uh, with that, we will go to Director Barr. Actually, I'll go ahead and defer to Director Walton. She uh, had her hand up before me. Okay. Director Walton. Thank you. Um, I, um, I kind of was having the same thoughts as Director Smith. Um, but I would just sort of add to that and build upon that idea that 
smaller communities don't have as deep of resources. So when she says project manager of the project manager, small communities don't even have a project manager and might not even have the bandwidth with the lean and mean staff, for example, at Lafayette, um, that, uh, you know, to attend all the different things and places. So I, it hadn't occurred to me that thought and that idea, but along those same lines, um, I, I feel like there are lots of different plans and conversations happening. Um, and, and a place where there can be uh, where where different tools and examples can come together because I think you know in the conversations that I have been part of just even in Boulder County it was you know it's been recognized that every community is going to have a different set of tools to get to a particular goal um, in Boulder County most if not all of the jurisdictions have adopted a 12 percent deed restricted affordable housing goal but how each community gets there could look and be very very different and, and everybody's starting from a different place right um, the needs are very different and so I think that that um, I would just want to weave in the thoughtfulness of the different size of and, and challenges that different jurisdictions in the Dr. Cog region have. Um, the um, I'll also just note too that we saw a draft plan in Lafayette last week of a of an economic and housing study. Um, it's very exciting. It's so great to have ideas that have popped in my head over my seven years on council to see it on paper and and hopefully start to get some traction. Um, but I think that you know those are ideas that that if we start doing um, or maybe there are other ideas that that you all and other communities are doing. So some kind of way to to bring, um, you know, big bulletin boards, we can all post ideas and, and share um, some, something like that. I don't know that it's necessarily the ad hoc committee, but maybe um, I'll just kind of throw that out there. Um, and then in the spirit of lean and mean, we, um, uh, at our council meeting last night, there was a huge shout out to the staff. Um, the, the staff in Lafayette has been really burned by a lot of stressors lately um, as, you know, that's not new to, to Lafayette necessarily, um, but it, I was glad that the, the city administrator took the time to sort of like run down the list of all the things um, because as a council member, um, we get, you know, it all it's all cold into this beautiful agenda and they make it really easy for us. And we don't necessarily appreciate the day-to-day, -day. Um, but then he also added, <laughs> And there's also the hiring challenges, which I'm imagining everybody is struggling with. So with that in mind, <laughs> assuming that isn't going to unsolve itself quickly, um, I know the staff could probably spend 40 hours a week just in meetings. So the less staff centric it can be, and maybe the encouragement of, you know, our high paying elected official positions. <laughs> um, maybe the better or, you know, additional hired staff. Um, I, that would be the way I'd want to tip, at least today. <laughs> so, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Director. Director Barr. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I just wanted to say, too, that, you know, I'm, I'm really excited to see Dr. Cog going in this direction um, and that, uh, you know, Littleton being a, a landlocked municipality has obviously been experiencing many of the same challenges that many of the Denver metro municipalities have. And while we are kind of stealing bits and pieces of playbooks of other municipalities to see what is working, what isn't working, I think, you know, I'm really proud of the fact that the city as a whole has been building up to, you know, a vote we just took on an affordable housing ordinance. Um, I'm very proud that we're going to be putting our own, you know, getting our own small pot of money out there to uh, to put towards, um, you know, uh, specifically low income housing uh, projects and uh, and putting a, a small but, you know, I think meaningful uh, bite out of all development projects that need to be part of a low income housing portfolio. That all being said. I, I think my concern is shared amongst other council members that we don't quite know what works. And this is kind of my proposition to Dr. Cog as kind of a convening and regional authority is to be looking at the data and evidence, not only from like municipal structures, um, throughout, not throughout the country, but even throughout Colorado to see what is working and to measure the, the efficacy of the policies that many of our municipalities are, are, have either enacted or are about to enact. 
um, because, you know, quite honestly, it's not my forte, but I have no idea whether a 5% set aside or a 7% set aside is going to have the desired or intended results in our part of the Denver metro area. And I think what we could really, and uh, like was aforementioned, our, our staffing is, you know, at capacity and is, you know, we are, we are working our staff hard and they are working hard for us. Um, we are going to be hiring on a housing specific uh, staff person in the coming years to look at affordable housing projects driven by the city, driven by South Metro housing options as well. But with all that being said, we kind of lack the all-encompassing vision to do monitoring and evaluation of effectiveness of these policies at that larger scale. So we can look to you all to say, whose parking policy is working really well and not stymieing development, but uh, you know, hitting that right balance. Um, and to that same end, have, you know, not just looking at it from a policy level, but who are the players, actors, developers that we can proactively uh, reach out to and target who have very specific expertise. I think my municipality, amongst others, are tend to kind of be at the whim of whoever walks through the door first or whoever bought that parcel first. And having a, a more consolidated proactive outreach strategy so we can target uh, you know, our staff to say, can you reach out to this pool of developers who specialize in LIHTC product um, or this kind of look or that kind of infill project um, so we can be a little bit more uh, strategic about who we're talking with and not just recycling the same people over and over again. So I would suggest, you know, that, that would be my hope for something that as a, as a work planning process. Thank you very much, Director Barr. Uh, Director Starker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Doug, I'm really glad that you brought this uh, this proposal forward and this information forward. We've, uh, you know, this is a, uh, I'm sure every community, this is really right on the, on the top of the of the uh, priority buttons. Um, we're, uh, we're finishing up and had our first uh, sort of download on an affordable housing study with a grant out of DOLA. I'm sure many communities are doing this. Uh, it's, it's really, um, it seemed to be a really valuable exercise for us to look at our housing on a really local and, uh, you know, uh, what happens locally in our community in order to sort of find out what the, what the data points are, what the, uh, what the preferences might be among council on, on where we and how we direct those. And that may be different for each community. Where I think Dr. Cog may play a, a valuable role is, uh, is sort of in their technical knowledge and data points and particularly around corridor, uh, the corridor uh, study that we looked at and the densification along the corridor. I think when we look at opportunities for affordable housing, a lot of that is gonna be focused on transportation corridors, how they mix, because I think if we can do that, then we alleviate some of the pressure and the uh, anxiety that happens in the single family uh, neighborhoods that that sort of are beyond the beyond the traffic uh, uh, corridors, and the other thing that I think uh, Dr. Cog has a really uh, strong leg up is the senior housing and maybe senior housing options that we look at, and uh, not only in uh, in rental sen affordable senior housing, but also in new models of for sale senior housing, where where we can recycle some of these larger single family homes and. And, uh, you know, my family, uh, you know, we finally gotten the last of the kids out, I hope I'm knocking on wood, and uh, have this large, you know, this, uh, these large bedrooms to, to occupy, but would be looking maybe to find a, a different and more available senior housing option that, uh, you know, a lock it and leave it kind of situation, but also where we own the, uh, you know, we own the real estate or we have a, an equity interest in it. And, but, but they're, you know, and to be able to, to really get feedback from our from our uh, excellent senior programs on what would really help the that community going forward. So, uh, I think it's hard to say how you um, how you start duplicating um, uh, visions or duplicating exercises, but I think you really don't know that until you get folks together in a room and say, you know, we represent different communities around the metropolitan area. Uh, what are what are we doing individually in other parts of the area? We've got a pretty strong um, uh, countywide organization, you know, working through uh, 
uh, through, uh, you know, a range of services from homelessness through, uh, you know, affordable housing and, and the temporary housing with wraparound services to supportive housing and workforce housing, and then finally getting folks, uh, you know, uh, transferred into, into permanent housing. So I think it's a great idea. I think there's a lot of work to do, and thanks for bringing it up. Thank you, Director. Briefly, before we continue with uh, live comments, uh, Director Maurer, uh put in chat, I agree that many agencies are already doing studies, but we may each have different needs. Example, Centennial is fairly landlocked and have a big need for middle type housing stock. I wanted to share that comment from uh, Director Maurer. With that, Director Odoricio. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Got it, thank you. Um, I think it makes sense that that Dr. Cog weigh in on this stuff. I was a pre I appreciate Lisa Smith's um, comments that we don't want to duplicate if we can. Uh, this is how I interpret what she was saying. If we can try to make it where it's compatible or supportive of our local efforts. But I think that also then brings up two issues. What are we going to do both proactively and reactively? Proactively, it makes sense that we have a Dr. Cog that can help us identify, I think as, as a few other folks mentioned, where our um, data points, do data, uh, best practices, information sharing, but also how can we use Proposition 123? Because as that proposition came out, more and more folks realized that this is that there that the proposition that was supposed to be a statewide measure was not going to be potentially as inclusive or accessible or uh, applicable to majority of the local um, governments and uh, jurisdictions throughout the state. So proactively, it would be nice for us to be able to go out there and say, look, this is information, we're sharing it, but also here's how you can access Prop 123 or how we might need to tweak it with rulemaking so it is applicable to more people, not just the folks who, who, who proposed it in the central area of the, of the state. Uh, and it's not a knock on Denver. It's just saying that sometimes we do, you know, our legislators make these decisions uh, in a vacuum or they, uh, people who put together these initiatives do it and they're like, oh, this works great in my backyard, so it must work great everywhere. Which brings me to, in addition to the proactive, Dr. Cog might have to be reactive. And that's important because it's my understanding that there's a potential for some legislation to, 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 to prescribe potential restrictions or some boxes around local control for cities and counties. The question that you're gonna to have to ask yourself is are we willing to let the state tell us about how we want to do housing and land use. And most of the time in the state of Colorado, local control is a sacred cow, right? Like, like that's pretty important to most of the folks on this call. How much do you want to give the state control to tell you you can't have single family zoning? How much do you want the state to tell you you have to meet certain requirements as defined by the state? I'm going to tell you now, with the way the legislature is written, we may not be able to say no to a whole lot of things this year. What is going to potentially work is us to be able to say, tell us what you're trying to do and let us come to you with some better solutions that we can live with. And that's where we might need to be reactive slash on the defense, working together and saying, this is what we think might be better than having the folks under the gold dome make a decision for us. And so once again, the proactive information sharing, making sure like Lisa was saying to not duplicate effort, make sure it's compatible with our local stuff, but defensively folks, we've got, they're gonna, they're gonna talk about building code. They're gonna be talking about rental versus buy. These are all issues that we need to weigh in on. And right now, there are folks under the Gold Dome planning on what you do in your community. And you used to be local control and land use was purely within the realm of local governments. And if we can't step, you can't just sit there nowadays and say, nope, we disagree, we're gonna fight you on it. No, you're gonna have to do some positive redirection. A lot like we did with some of us who are parents or even like, you know, whether you're a dog parent or a human parent, you have a little positive redirection and say, let us come up with some solutions because this is what we do all day, every day. Those are just my thoughts. Thank you very much. And a couple of comments and uh, comments agreeing with you there. And I would echo that as well. Director Spear. 
Thank you. Um, I was just going to address uh, kind of the questions as well as some of the things that the folks have been um, speaking to. Overall, yes, I think this is a um, good direction um, for, for this group. I think uh, there was a question about what kinds of perspectives to um, represent uh, in this committee. Um, for me, a lot of that is, you know, a lot of us here in this group were homeowners, um, probably many of us in uh, single family homes. So, you know, as we're thinking about this kind of bigger housing policy, are we making sure to bring in perspectives from renters, from seniors, from uh, lower income folks, from people who don't have access, um, easy access to housing, as well as those with the policy um, in kind of local expertise. Um, I agree with what some of the other folks have been talking about regarding um, helping to sort of herd the cats at a regional level. Um, I mean, I think often about how the housing that we didn't build in Boulder over the last 30 years has really affected Superior, Erie, Lafayette, Longmont, Louisville, um, all of those those other communities within our county. And, you know, so how, how can we um, how can we be a resource for communities as they're thinking about sharing the burden in a way that um, feels you know, more comfortable, maybe at a local level, but at a regional level, we're able to accomplish the goals that we're setting out to do. Um, I was also thinking like Director Odoricio about the state legislation um, and how you know, we we are likely to stop having choices in some of these things. So um, what what are what are we going to, you know, do to be kind of shaping the legislation in a way that works for um, for our region? And and also just thinking about what's working well across the region. How can we, you know, use this as a sort of an information consolidation type of place, providing some technical assistance to uh, communities? Um, and I think looking at, you know, hearing back from uh, individual communities, what are they needing um, and, and what can we uniquely do um, and how can we try to accommodate some of the state legislation that may be coming at a regional level. So again, maybe in a way that we can share, share the burden. So, you know, maybe not every single city within is meeting whatever that goal is, but regionally, can we, can we aim to do it? And can there be, you know, incentives for, for uh, communities that are more willing to take on some of those those burdens of meeting um, meeting meeting those goals. Um, if that's if that's a way that we can you know think about how we can work together. Um, and the other thing that I was thinking about including in the charge for this committee is um, alignment with our mitigation action plan because there there is absolutely as you referenced during the presentation a lot of information in there that ties into housing related topics and so it, the more that I think we can link back to the other work that Dr. Cog has already been doing for a long time um, the more successful we're going to be. Thank you. Thank you very much Director Mulvey. Hi yeah my um whoops <laughs> I guess who didn't want to be seen. There you go. <laughs> The, um, there's so many great comments, and I'm just going to sort of tick off what I'm thinking as I digest them. Last one really resonated because we are looking at, yes, the legislature imposing a lot of um, requirements and policies and procedures on local government, which is, in some eyes, a constitutional question but in other eyes, some other kind of question, but I agree that that's a huge concern. But then I also think about why, uh, why would anyone like us, we in the transportation world also want to impose requirements? So we have to really be careful how we do that. Um, also, where is housing? You know, we cannot think about what we think is right when we know darn well that the people we work with live far away because that is the only place they can afford the housing. So we have to account for what exists and what they need to get to work. So if somebody lives out in Parker and they need to get to DTC, they have no public transportation to do it. So we can't impose a lot on them in order to do that, unless we're gonna make a huge policy change and get the legislature behind it. So we also can't force them to move because they might have kids that need to live where their friends and their schools are. They may have chosen a neighborhood. There are so many components to this, which brings me to 
the concepts of the small community and what small communities and partnerships like Douglas County has for housing have the ability to really determine and see what in your local community is needed, just like our sub-regional transportation forums. So we need to account for all of that. And then lastly, the employers are the ones that need to be at the table because in my view, maybe they're part of the solution. Look at what CDOT's doing in the mountains and in other places. They're providing housing allowances or other kinds of benefits. They might even build housing. So where one entity or governmental entity might not be able to make a change, employers might be able to bring something to the table. In addition, they can also tell us who is at issue here. For example, we have a lot of young people who just finished a very expensive degree and want to have a family, but there's no public transportation to take them where they can afford to live to their big company that's doing awesome things for our economy. Those are real things and they're not gonna get less than 80 AMI benefits. They're not considered workforce housing in the traditional sense. So we have to include everybody that is contributing to our economy and everybody that has needs, all kinds of employers and all kinds of families. And so in closing, I do think that Dr. Cog does need to get into the conversation very quickly and that it is a very good place to get into the conversation with the legislature because we represent our local communities and that's exactly the role we serve for transportation. And that's what we can bring to the table to the legislature. Not every, not everybody's going to do that at the legislative level in the same way that an entity like Dr. Cog that has a certain amount of power can. Yep. Okay, thank you, Director Shaw. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I uh, so many good comments that I've heard. I liked very much the way the presentation brought this to uh, linking these needs to Dr. Cog's vision and uh, positioned us as a long range planner, uh, a resource for data and a convener. I think those are the important things. I know that the municipal level we're really charged with um, short-term solutions uh, as well as the long-range planning. And I think that um, that may help us work with some of the overlap uh, concerns um, uh, because long-range planning I, is where I see Dr. Cobb can bring the most value. Uh, they may also uh, I think we'll find that uh, Dr. Cog is a resource for uh, some of the broader needs that we share across our communities, you know, bigger picture, long term, uh, particularly the types of housing that we're going to need and um, maybe some help uh, at the legislature um, you know, we talk about the need for diverse housing for all age groups and, and income levels. And part of this comes from construction defects legislation of several years ago. So, um, you know, if we can band together to, um, with the housing um, groups, the coalition of housing support groups and employers, you know, perhaps we can get this changed and we can take care of the people who um, may uh, be aging out of their, their big homes and uh, um, take care of the, the beginning or entry level people who are just above the 80% uh, area median income. So it is that that long range where I think Dr. Cog finds the sweet spot. And um, as a convener and a planner, 
um, I think this is a wonderful uh, organization um, to support these conversations and uh, some some forward thinking. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before we continue with live comments, I wanted to uh, make reference to Director Odoricio, who put Dr. Cog, CCI, CCAT, CML, and special districts need to rally together, not just at the Capitol, but before proposals are written. The, the operative thing is it's too late to wait and testify at the state committee, which I think is a, a great point that, that that involvement beforehand is really important. Director Hazeman. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Conklin. One of the subjects that we just go right past in, in my city and perhaps here with Dr. Cog is communication. We all are involved in our different cities and areas of interest and expertise. And so we're on board with regard to the value of affordable housing, whether it's for seniors or for families, but the public does not have the same knowledge we have and I feel that in my city of Golden, uh, we're working hard trying to be sure that we can put together a series of articles in our local communications that can make clear to the regular public, to not just the elected officials, the value of affordable housing, workforce housing, senior housing. And so I don't want to just get one two-pager. I'd like to see Dr. Cog take on a communication role that discusses the various real good reasons why affordable housing is important and not just jump in and start playing a role without setting the foundation, even in our own Dr. Cog group about, we have a common understanding of the value. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. And I agree. I think I've said many a time that if you use the phrase affordable housing with a cross section of people, their definition is going to vary person by person by person, which is part of, of the foundation of, of our retreat, where we kind of started with some of those questions and, and working on a shared vision for what that means. So I, I think you raise a, a very good point. Um, other comments? Mr. Rex, is this helpful? Are there things that this has brought up that, that you'd like to, to get more reaction on? I'll tell you, I'm I'm actually a little overwhelmed by the by the comments. I it was it was a lot and it's great. I'm so appreciative of all the input. Um and 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 I agree with almost everything that was said here. I really like, you know, Commissioner Odoricio kind of kind of captured it, right, with regards to this proactive role and this reactive role, right? And, um, and I, I see there's opportunities for both of those, right? And they're, they're not necessarily in conflict. There's, there's an immediate need to have conversations, of course, as, as uh, Director Odoricio mentioned, with the state regarding conversations that may or may not be occurring at the Capitol right now that we need to make sure we're, that we're engaged in, for sure, um, on behalf of our member local governments. And, uh, and we'll, we'll reach out to um, you know, partner agency, uh, partner associations, C, uh, CML and and um, and uh, and others to to have those conversations for sure. Um, yeah, and, and I I really like this idea of us putting kind of knitting together what other communities are doing and providing somewhat of a best practices on certain things. Um, listen, I, I and and I do like I still think there's an opportunity here for um, for this role that we kind of recommended with regards to looking out into the future, right, and and establishing to make sure that it's a data driven uh, conversation about what we expect in the future and being prepared for that. And that's kind of that proactive role, right? Um, that I'd like to have more conversation about. But this has been wonderful for me. I think it provides uh, a lot of meat there for for staff to to uh, to noodle on and uh, and we can bring something back to you more specific next month um, but but like you say I I uh, I'm, I applaud all of you for all the work that you guys are doing in housing you can tell that it's emotional for everybody right and everybody's so engaged in this topic because it's so important so thank you so very much great thank you uh, without any other comments on this topic, uh, two more fairly quick things. One, I just want to acknowledge uh, today is Pearl Harbor Day. Uh, 81 years ago today, Pearl Harbor was was hit. 
Uh, more than 2,300 people died in uh, Pearl Harbor. And I want to share a brief story that ties it to our region. Uh, one of the other hats I wear is as president of a nonprofit that preserves the history of radio and TV in Colorado. And back in 1941, a gentleman, Ensign Thomas McClellan, uh, was in the Naval Reserves and worked at KLZ Radio as chief engineer and uh, went into active duty, was stationed in Pearl Harbor uh, in September of 1941. Uh, when Pearl Harbor was attacked, he survived, but died of smoke inhalation in saving the, the gentlemen on his, the, the people on his, uh, his ship. Uh, he was awarded a Purple Heart, and in 1943, they named a ship after him, the USS McClelland. Uh, and uh, just kind of an interesting story of, of one, one of those many people, but somebody from our region that, that was somebody who volunteered and was, was one of the victims of Pearl Harbor. But at this time, I want to just remember all of the 2300, if anyone had family or, or associates, you know, people that in your, your lineage uh, that were involved in that, uh, just wanted to, to acknowledge Pearl Harbor at this point in time. Uh, thank you for indulging me on, on that briefly. Uh, I do want to mention that we likely will have a board meeting on December 21st. Uh, it will be a virtual board meeting if we do. It will have, we believe, a singular topic. Mr. Rex? <laughs> no, thank you all very much. I cringed when you brought that up because I knew what the reaction would be. Um, yeah, so we're, we're uh, it, it, it's regarding family, uh, the, the new law, and we're still trying to figure out if we're eligible for uh, to, to at least have a conversation about opting out. Um, we believe we are, but we're not quite there yet. So we'd like to leave open the option of having a virtual meeting on the 21st. So please don't remove that, that, that uh, counter invite from your calendar yet, um, but you, we'll, we'll get uh, additional information out to you all um, early next week at the latest. So, so thank you for your indulgence on that. It'll be and quick. And if, if we do, it will be hopefully relatively short. It will. Uh, <laughs> it will be virtual, but it will be very important to have a quorum. So uh, just, just would ask that uh, everybody stay tuned and, and see what happens there. Any other matters for the good of the order? All right. With that, thank you all very much. Very much appreciate being here tonight. And great, great conversation. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Also very Good much. night. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank Good you. night.